in the exchange we just had earlier this afternoon, uh, you detailed a, a very broad understanding of the President's potential authority and that, try as I might, I could not find a hypothetical that you considered to be beyond the power of the President. I'd like to ask you now a question that I've asked Attorney General Holder and that he repeatedly declined to answer, and it's in a different context. It concerns the civil liberties and privacy rights of Americans and drone policy. And my question to you is, in your legal judgment, is it constitutional for the federal government to utilize a drone strike against an American citizen on U.S. soil if that individual does not pose an imminent threat? Well, Senator, cer Senator certainly I'm not aware of legal authority um, that, would, that would authorize that, nor am I aware of a policy seeking uh, authorization to do that. If you could share more information with me. My question is about the constitutional limits on the federal government's power. Attorney General Holder repeatedly declined to answer the question about whether it is constitutional for a drone to use lethal force against an American citizen on U.S. soil if that individual doesn't pose imminent threat. Now, let me be clear. I think the answer to this is very easy. My question to you is, is it constitutional for the federal government to do so? Well, Senator, I think with respect to the use of lethal force by any means, one would always want to look at the law enforcement issues involved there. And certainly, if you could provide more context there, I could place it in the, in the scope of a, either a case or an issue that I might have familiarity with. Ms. Lynch, it, it is in the nature of a hypothetical. But you are certainly aware that the federal government is currently using drone strikes overseas. The federal I'm government also maintains drone surveillance domestically here at home. This Senate had an extended debate on the limits of federal government authority with respect to the privacy and civil rights of American citizens. And I'm asking you, in your view, does the Constitution give any protection to American citizens? Is, is, does the Constitution allow the federal government to do what it has done overseas, utilize lethal force from a drone, could it do so against an American citizen here at home if that individual did not pose an imminent threat? Senator, with respect to the use of, again, as I said before, with, of lethal force by any means, be it drone or someone on the street, the, the use of lethal force is generally regulated by either police guidance or by the nature of the interaction. Based on what you are describing to me, I don't see interaction between the American citizen that you are referring to and anyone to generate the type of lethal force that you are referring to. I, I, I'm disappointed that, that, like Attorney General Holder, you are declining to give a simple, straightforward answer, and in fact, what I think is the obvious answer of no, the federal government cannot use lethal force from a drone to kill an American citizen on American soil if that individual doesn't pose an imminent threat. I, I don't view that as a difficult legal question, and indeed, it demonstrates what I think has been the consistent failing of this administration's approach to constitutional law is that it always, always, always opts in favor of government power. Let me ask you a different question. This administration's Department of Justice went before the United States Supreme Court and argued that law enforcement could place a GPS on any American citizen's automobile with no probable cause and no articulable suspicion. And your legal judgment is placing a GPS on, on the automobile of the men and women gathered here with no probable cause or articulable suspicion. Is that consistent with the Fourth Amendment's protections of, of American citizens? I believe the Supreme Court has resolved that issue, Senator, and I believe that the that law enforcement agencies seeking to use that type of technique would need to obtain a warrant. You are correct. The Supreme Court resolved that issue. It resolved it unanimously, 9-0. It rejected the Holder Justice Department's position. My question is, if you were Attorney General at the time, would you have agreed with that argument that law enforcement can place GPSs on any American citizen's car? Well, certainly, Senator, I wasn't involved in the legal analysis or discussion then. Based upon the practice prior to the Supreme Court 
argument and the fact that law enforcement had used various techniques, this was a new technique that was being evaluated and had been used in a variety of ways. So my understanding was that after a careful consideration of precedent and practice, the department made a strong argument. The Supreme Court has reasoned and has ruled um, that a warrant is required. And certainly that is the law of the land. Should I be confirmed as Attorney General, that is certainly the practice that I would follow. The Obama Justice Department 22 times has gone before the Supreme Court arguing for broader government authority. And 22 times it has been unanimously rejected. 9-0 the court has rejected those claims. Another case was a case called Hosanna Tabor, where the Obama Justice Department argued before the Supreme Court that the First Amendment has no relevance, says nothing about whether a church may select its own ministers or pastors. Do you agree with that position that was put forth by this Justice Department? Well, Senator, I have not read the briefs on that, so certainly I'm not aware of the full articulation of that position. But I believe the Supreme Court has spoken and has resolved that issue. Certainly, should I be confirmed as Attorney General, I would follow that precedent. You are correct again. The Supreme Court resolved that 9-0 rejecting the opinion, and I would note Justice Elena Kagan, an appointee of this president, said from the bench in that argument mm -hmm. to the Department of Justice's lawyer, I find your position amazing that the Justice Department would argue the First Amendment does nothing, says nothing about a church's ability to appoint its own ministers and pastors. Let, let me ask you, if, if you are confirmed as Attorney General, Will you commit to this committee to provide greater scrutiny to the positions the Justice Department takes before the Supreme Court, and in particular, to stop the practice over and over again of advocating for broad government power, which has resulted in 22 times the Supreme Court unanimously rejecting that, that, that argument? Senator, should I be so fortunate as to be confirmed as Attorney General? I will take every case that comes before the Department of Justice seriously. I will consult with the career prosecutors there, also within the Solicitor General's office, on the facts of the case, the relevant law, and in conjunction with them, give, provide my best judgment as to the approach to take. Is it your understanding of the role of the Attorney General that the Department of Justice should always advocate greater government power? Senator, my view is that the Department of Justice um, advocates to defend statutes as passed by Congress and that its greatest function is to represent the American people. With respect to specific cases, again, I will always do as I have done in, throughout my career as a lawyer. I will carefully examine the facts of the case, the relevant law, precedent, and make the best reasoned argument that there is to support the position that's being advocated. Well, let's shift to another area where this Department of Justice has not been, in my view, faithfully enforcing the law. In May of 2013, the Inspector General of the Treasury Department concluded that the IRS had wrongfully targeted citizen groups for their political views. When that news broke, President Obama publicly said he was outraged. He said he was angry, and he said the American people had a right to be angry. Ms. Lynch, do you agree with what President Obama said then, that the American people have a right to be angry at the IRS targeting citizens for their political views? Senator, my view is that uh, political views or bias have no place in the, uh, in the way in which not only the Department of Justice, but all agencies carry out their duties. And certainly, when people hear of something that raises that issue, I can understand their concerns. In the nearly two years that have transpired, the individual who led the IRS office in question, Ms. Lois Lerner, has testified twice before Congress and has pleaded the fifth, which, as you are well aware, means she raised her hand and said, if I answer your questions, it means I may incriminate myself in criminal conduct. In the nearly two years since that, that time has transpired, not a single person has been indicted. The nearly two years since that time has transpired, many of the victims of the illegal targeting have yet to be interviewed by the FBI or the Department of Justice. And in the nearly two years that have transpired, we have discovered that the Department of Justice appointed to lead the investigation a partisan Democrat who has been a major donor to President Obama and the Democratic Party. Indeed, she has given over $6,000 to President Obama 
and the Democratic Party. In your view, is it consistent with fairly and impartially enforcing the law to have an investigation into the abuse of power by the IRS headed by a major Democratic donor? Senator, my understanding of that investigation is really from public records. I'm not familiar with the specifics of it. I can certainly tell you that complex investigations often do take several months, if not a year or more, to resolve. And I don't know the status of the witness interviews at this point, so I'm not able to provide you information on that point that you raise. With respect to how an investigation is staffed, again, I believe that, that um, while I'm not familiar with the details of this, certainly I, my view is that the department has career prosecutors who are devoted to the Constitution and to the fair and effective exercise of their judgment, um, and that the department has made the decision as to how to best staff the case and manage the case. I'm just not able to comment on the length of time or other issues that you raise. Certainly, should I be confirmed, I look forward to learning more about the matter. And I, as, as I've said before, Senator, I appreciate your raising concerns with me, and I hope that you will continue to do so should I have the opportunity to work with you in the future. You know, one of the terrific things about the Department of Justice is that it has a long and bipartisan tradition of remaining above the fray from partisan politics, of demonstrating a fidelity to law, so that when serious accusations of abuse of power, and in fact of abusing the IRS, were raised against Richard Nixon, his Attorney General, Elliot Richardson, a Republican, appointed an independent counsel to investigate those allegations free of any taint of propriety or partisan bias. Likewise, when serious allegations of wrongdoing against William Clinton were raised, his Attorney General, Janet Reno, a, a Democrat, made the same determination to appoint an independent counsel, Robert Fisk, to investigate the matter free of partisan bias or taint. The question I would ask you, if you are confirmed as Attorney General, would you commit to this committee to appoint a special prosecutor to investigate the IRS abuse of power, who at a very minimum is not a major Obama donor and who can be counted on to actually investigate the facts and follow them wherever they may lead? Senator, again, I'm not familiar with the investigation in great detail at this point. My understanding is that that matter has been considered and that the matter has been resolved to continue with the investigation as currently set forth. Should I be confirmed as Attorney General, I can commit to you that I will take seriously every allegation of abuse of power brought to my attention and in conjunction with career prosecutors and this body where appropriate, make the best decision about how to handle that investigation. Ms. Lynch, you're correct. The, the, the matter has been considered. Indeed, I sent a letter to Attorney General Holder laying out the facts and asking him to follow the bipartisan tradition of his predecessors and uphold the rule of law. And he responded in writing that he was declining to appoint a special prosecutor. And the basis of, of his declining to do so was the, quote, discretion of the Attorney General. So despite the internal DOJ rules that require recusal if there's even an appearance of, uh, of bias, the Attorney General refused to appoint a special prosecutor. You've stated you're not familiar with this investigation. I think that's unfortunate because when you and I visited over a month ago in my office, we talked about this investigation. I told you it was a very serious concern of mine, and I asked before your hearing if you would take the time to familiarize yourself with what had occurred. And yet your answer today is that you're not aware of what's happening. Let, let me ask a more general question. Would you trust John Mitchell? to investigate Richard Nixon. You're referring to former uh, Attorney General Mitchell? Yes. Again, Senator, again, I'm based on that hypothetical, I'd have to know what the issue was and what you were requesting him to do. Would you trust John Mitchell to investigate the allegations of wrongdoing in the break-in at Watergate against Richard Nixon? Would you trust John Mitchell, who had run Richard Nixon's campaign, to investigate the allegations that ultimately led to Richard Nixon resigning the presidency? Well, I think that matter has been resolved. Uh, indeed. Um, um, and certainly with respect to how that matter should have been handled and Attorney General Mitchell's involvement in it, I believe his role in it 
um, has been resolved as well. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not able, I don't, I don't think I'm understanding the basis of your question, sir. Ms. Lynch, there are many of us who are alumni of the Department of Justice who have most respected the department when it demonstrated independence from the president, when the department was willing to stand up to the president, when the attorney general behaved not as if he or she were the personal lawyer for the president who appointed them, but rather when the attorneys general in both parties have behaved as independent impartial law enforcement officers who owe a fidelity to the Constitution and the laws. Prior to becoming Attorney General, Eric Holder had a reputation as a U.S. Attorney of upholding the law. And I was hopeful when he was appointed that he would carry that reputation forward as Attorney General. It has saddened me greatly that he has not done so. And I will say it is disappointing in this hearing that try as I might, there has been nothing I have been able to ask you that has yielded any answer suggesting any limitations whatsoever on the authority of the president. That does not augur well for this committee's assessment of your willingness to stand up to the president when the Constitution and the laws so require. Do you agree with that characterization? Senator, as I've indicated before, I believe that the role of the Attorney General is to provide their most objective, well-researched, independent legal advice to the President or any agency who may come before them with, a, with request for an opinion. And where there is a legal basis for the request being made, to indicate so. But where there is not, to also tell the President or any other executive agency that what they are asking for is not within the framework of the law. I believe that that's the role of the Attorney General. I believe the Attorney General must represent the people of the United States. And should I be so fortunate as to be confirmed, they will be my client and they will be my first thought. The they that you refer to as your client, I, I just for clarification, uh, to, to whom did the they refer? I'm sorry. It refer to the American people. And yet, and, and I'll, I'll ask again, can, can you articulate any limitations on the authority of the president that as attorney general you would be pre prepared to stand up and tell the president no there is some modicum of power you do not have senator i believe that the role of the attorney general does encompass the role of advising the president of when actions do not have the appropriate legal framework and when they may not be undertaken that is something that i believe is an important part of the functions of the Attorney General, and certainly should I be so, confirmed, so fortunate as to be confirmed, is something that I would not hesitate to do. It is part of the function of the Attorney General, even though a cabinet member, to be independent of the President and to provide their best independent legal judgment on any issue presented to them. Well, I hope that you will very much carry through on that. It is discouraging that in the course of this hearing you have been unwilling to say that the President lacks the authority to refuse to enforce tax laws, labor laws, environmental laws, immigration laws, that you, you have declined to say that the President cannot order a drone strike on an American citizen on U.S. soil, and that you have refused to commit to a fair and impartial investigation of the IRS abuse of power by a special prosecutor. I hope, if you are confirmed, that your conduct in office differs from the answers you have given at this hearing. My time has now expired. Um, I see Senator Leahy is here, so I recognize Senator Leahy. I'm, I see Senator Tillis here, too. I'll